Today we're going to talk about voice and point of view in use of speaker and persona. As usual, we're going to be talking about this in the context of the poems for this week, or some of the poems for this week. So if you haven't already, go read Philip Larkin's Obad and the two, po two poems by uh, Gwendolyn Brooks. We real cool in the bean eaters. We're going to be starting with the Gwendolyn Brooks poems in our discussion. Uh, Brooks reads We Real Cool. You can find a recording of her reading this online. And the way she reads is, is reads it is different from the way that I was taught to read poetry and the way that I told you to read poetry. Um, she actually pauses at the end of each of these lines. So you can find a recording of her. Uh, I will attempt to do her reading justice now. We Real Cool by Gwendolyn Brooks. The Pool Players, Seven at the Golden Shovel. We Real Cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz June, we die soon. Next we have The Bean Eaters, also by Gwendolyn Brooks. They eat beans mostly, this old yellow pear. Dinner is a casual affair. Plain chipware on a plain and creaking wood. Tin flatware. Two who are mostly good, two who have lived their day, but keep putting on their clothes and putting things away. And remembering, remembering with twinklings and t twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases, and fringes. Uh, before we move on, I want to note that this last, this last thing is one entire line. Um, I had to knock it onto the next line to just for space concerns, but this is, this is all meant to be on the same line. Okay, let's move now to Philip Larkin's Obad. Um, Obad is a word that means a song to greet the morning. Um, more or less, that's what it means. Uh, just like a sonnet, which you may be familiar with from other English classes, a sonnet is a love poem. Usually uh, the idea is that that is said from one lover to another in the evening when they meet or talking about how much they love each other in the evening. The obad is a song between lovers or poem between lovers when they part at the beginning of the day, uh, knowing that they will see each other again that evening. So this is Philip Larkin's Obad. I work all day and get half drunk at night. Waking at four to soundless dark, I stare. In time, the curtain edges will grow light. Till then, I see what's really always there. Unresting death. A whole day nearer now, making all thought impossible, but how and where and when I shall myself die. Arid interrogation, yet the dread of dying and being dead flashes afresh to hold and horrify. The mind blanks at the glare, not in remorse, the good not done, the love not given, time torn off unused, nor wretchedly, because an only life can take so long to climb clear of its wrong beginnings, and may never, but at the total emptiness forever, the sure extinction that we travel to and shall be lost in always, not to be here, not to be anywhere, and soon, nothing more terrible, nothing more true. This is a special way of being afraid no trick dispels. Religion used to try, 
that vast moth-eaten musical brocade created to pretend we never die, and specious stuff that says no rational being can fear a thing it will not feel, not seeing that this is what we fear. No sight, no sound, no touch or taste or smell, nothing to think with, nothing to love or link with, the anesthetic from which none come round. And so it stays just on the edge of vision, a small unfocused blur, a standing chill that slows each impulse down to indecision. Most things may never happen. This one will. And realization of it rages out in furnace fear when we are caught without people or drink. Courage is no good. It means not scaring others. Being brave lets no one off the grave. Death is no different whined at than withstood. Slowly, light strengthens, and the room takes shape. It stands plain as a wardrobe. What we know, have always known, know that we can't escape, yet can't accept. One side will have to go. Meanwhile, telephones crouch, getting ready to ring in locked-up offices, and all the uncaring, intricate, rented world begins to rouse. The sky is white as clay, with no sun. Work has to be done. Postmen, like doctors, go from house to house. All right. So we have our, our three poems for this presentation. Uh, so when we're talking about voice and point of view, we're talking about the speaker's voice and point of view generally. And for your first assignment, when you're writing a persona poem, that speaker is someone who is not yourself. So you always need to think about how that speaker is going to sound, um, what their voice is going to be like, what kind of words they'd use, what kind of sentence structure they would use. You need to know what they think like, uh, what their patterns of speech are. If that person is like you, if it's someone who's similar to you, you can obviously write using your own voice, using your own diction, everything like that. But if they aren't, you need to think about how they're going to speak, not only in their mind to themselves, but also out loud how they would communicate to other people, especially if you have them talking out loud using dialogue in a poem, which is totally possible. So the speaker's voice will affect how your reader hears and understands your poem and you can use this if we go back to uh not obad so much but if we go back to the brooks poems um we real cool and uh, well why don't you pause and take some time and answer the questions about we real cool the bean eaters and obad who is the speaker? Who is the audience? And what is the what is the point of the poem? Take your time with this if you haven't already, and then come back. And while you're doing it, actually think about the voice. Uh, think about what that tells you about the people. All right. So if we look at "We Real Cool," you see the voice here is speaking in very short and simple sentences. Uh, and what might that tell us about these people? Well, we know that they left school. So they left school. They're speaking in short, simple sentences. The rhymes here are simple rhymes. They're, they're two-word rhymes. They use a lot of alliteration, which is, you know, can be interesting, but it's also kind of basic. They're not going for complicated end rhymes or anything like that. They're spending all their time playing pool which doesn't make them foolish by any means but we might say that they lack a formal education uh, and this is apparent in the writing here and that is something that you can you can use right there's simple sentences repetitive structure 
that they help us understand the speaker's mindset they're focused on the we the we that's why the word we ends almost every line in that poem they think of themselves as a group what they do together is the most important thing um, in the bean eaters we look at the voice there and we see you know mostly again simple sentences straightforward lines that are factual but then that final line which is incredibly long compared to the rest of the poem it stands out and it makes your readers or it makes brooks's readers and like i said you can use this yourself so it makes readers consider why are we spending so long talking about these trivial items what is so important about those things um and if you go back and take a look uh we know that in for the bean eaters uh if you think about them um our speaker we don't know too much about but we do know about these old yellowed pair of people uh yellowed in this case yellow in this case means that they're old they they've taken on a sort of yellow hue like uh, an old newspaper um they're poor right they they don't have very many things they live in a rented back room so they don't have they don't have a lot they eat beans which are cheap and filling but mostly cheap and they have all of these things this long sentence full of items that don't really stand out other than the fact that they exist in this long drawn out sentence that causes them to remember so all of these things are important to our speakers because their memories are attached to these objects their life centers around their memories of the good times that they've had they've lived their day uh, the good times that they've had when they picked up those beads, when they spent that money, got that doll, claws, smoked those cigarettes or cigars, um, you know, all of this stuff that exists in their life. So uh, using voice to set up that one long line to stand out, that's something that Brooks has done. Okay, so point of view in a poem doesn't just refer to first person, third person, or second person. I guess you could write a poem in the second person. It also refers to what the speaker can see or know. Where are they standing and what are they looking at? Uh, and what is interesting to them? If you've looked at the rubric that or not the rubric but the assignment sheet for assignment number one um you you should be thinking about what that person is or what your persona is interested in um what is compelling to them about the scene that they are looking at the the thing that they are experiencing so for an ant a lion might not be that important except as a gigantic golden mountain that they might have to climb that starts moving around a gazelle sees that lion as danger and they're worried about the muscles how fast that lion can move the fangs things like that uh so if we look back at larkin's obad most of the poem is completely lacking in sensory detail there aren't there isn't a lot of imagery taking place throughout the poem even though i told you and i still insist that vivid imagery is the language of poetry so why is that the case for this poem well the po or not the poet but the speaker in this poem is lying awake in bed staring into the soundless dark of their room and so there isn't anything visual to describe there aren't any sounds going on 
if you stay in a room long enough, the smells of the room become like nothing to you. They aren't eating or drinking anything. They are already half drunk from the beginning, so their senses are probably somewhat dampened anyway. And they they are just there with their thoughts of death. Also, though, this is extremely effective for the poem because uh, our, our poet thinks or our, our our speaker knows that no sight no sound no touch or taste or smell this is what death is like for the speaker this is what they imagine so i want you to push yourself a little bit when you're making a persona for your assignment Try something that makes you think, that makes you consider another person's voice and point of view. If you're not enjoying it, of course, you can stop and go back to something that's familiar to you. But it might be surprising to you to try to get in someone else's head and figure out what they are experiencing and imagining in a particular time. And, you know, this isn't something that you're limited to doing once. Obviously, you can try out a lot of different personas in the same event or try out a lot of different personas in different events or the same persona in different events. Just have fun with it and try to try to do something a little bit challenging. All right. Uh, as always, let me know if you have any questions.